thank you everyone. I'm just going to try and get rid of this message here. Um, I'm Dr. Alessandra Pino Ali, and I'm the co-author of A Gothic Cookbook. Um, and I'm going to introduce and talk a little bit about myself and my projects, if that's okay. Uh, I want to say thank you to Sam and to Romancing the Gothic, as always, for being so motivating and inspirational and providing the best platform for all the kind of weird talks and things that I want to, to, to discuss um, and are so supportive of me. Um, yes, yeah, so as I said, I'm the co-author of a Gothic cookbook. Here it is. Um, I've written this book along with my friend and food journalist, Ella Bucken. The book is illustrated by Lee Henry and it should be out sometime next year. We crowdfunded this project. So thank you so much to all of those who supported us. And it's taken a while to, to, to write it, to do all the recipes and more than 60 recipes. So we've done a lot of testing and it does, it does take the time that it takes, but um, there will be 13 chapters mm -hmm. and in each chapter, um, we will take a look at the food and drink in different Gothic stories and include recipes that are inspired by those food scenes. And Romancing the Gothic has actually already hosted a Dracula and a Frankenstein cook-along. So they should be on YouTube if you want to have a look. It's possible to pre-order a copy. So if this interests you, then head to the Unbound website. I wanted to show you some of the illustrations for the book because I'm so excited about it and they're so wonderful. And we've got like a Frankenstein up here in the corner, he's hiding in the bushes. And then someone over here is being undressed um, by, a, they have an artichoke dress on because it's the Angela Carter story, The Bloody Chamber. And we have a tea time here with Rebecca um, and some actual, uh, an actual photo of the real tea time, which were, was prepared by Ella, some wonderful cakes. I'm also the co-host of a podcast called Fear Feast, along with Vanessa Baca, with whom I have the absolute best time looking at horror through books and the films based on those books, or vice versa, through the lens of food and consumption. And we're at the end of our satanic season at the moment, and my favorite episode so far is The Exorcist one, and it's called Regan is Not a Vegan. And bear with me. And we look at all the food differences between the William Peter Blatty novel and the film directed by William Friedkin in order to gain more insight on deeper societal changes and other differences that food can tell us about. And it's just, I just have the best time. I've also started working on another podcast on the history of food called A is for Apple, an encyclopedia of food and drink with Dr. Neil Buttery and Sam Bilton. Um, they are two amazing food historians and writers. So if you think that any of this interests you, you might want to follow us, uh, that would be great. Thank you. And now I'm ready to start. Um, I wanted to explore the idea of Gothic consumption in Horacio Quiroga's short story, The Feather Pillow. I'm also very, very interested in knowing what you all think and um, yes, knowing your opinion on a few, few of my thoughts. So this story was first published in 1917 and there's actually no mention of food, but it does give me the opportunity to instead both extend the concept of consumption in the Gothic while zooming into what the idea of Gothic, Gothic consumption is by focusing on the dinner table as a food space. Essentially, dinner tables are surfaces that hold our food and by doing so also contain certain rituals attached to food. These spaces continue to preserve a meaning even when there is no food on them. And I'm working on something more comprehensive that includes fridges and other items, which I hope to bring to you next year on Romancing the Gothic if there's some space, but I know that slots are getting booked up already. So Quiroga, Horacio Quiroga, his life was tragic. Um, it was tragic from an early age, and I'm not going to go through all the tragedies, they are quite distressing, but his life was filled with very violent deaths and restlessness. He was born in 1878 in Uruguay, and he became interested in writing during his early 20s, very much inspired by Edgar Allan Poe, who had died around 30 years before his, death, uh, his birth. Quiroga was in fact known as Latin America's Poe, and he also lived in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, and then he went to the jungle, mainly in a remote area of Argentina called uh, Misiones. This move would change his life forever. He was, let's say, a city man. I don't know if that exists, but he'd come from an upper middle class background. His father had been vice consul in Argentina. And so this move to the jungle wasn't easy, but he loved it. 
It was said of Quiroga that the effect of the jungle was immediate and it marked him and he became a different man. So he starts going backwards and forwards between Buenos Aires, where he worked as a teacher, a writer, and was part of a literary circle of the city, and then back to the jungle where he undertook various other activities such as growing cotton and other enterprises which all ended in failure. But this kind of seemed to give him more impetus for other activities. So he was going from one environment to another, both so different. And perhaps it was these very sharp contrasts between lifestyles that contributed to his um, complexity when it comes to how he describes people in nature and the nature of people. And I wanted to focus on this contradiction on um, composure versus the wild, on the rational versus the inexplicable, and the formality of attempting to make things have a logical meaning versus the unexpected that is also a part of life and part of the individual that makes itself known, often with a brutal force. The jungle and the wilderness is the unexpected element that we don't just have to deal with occasionally then. And here my Gothic perspective jumps in with regards to his work. But we are talking about a darkness that is sown into our everyday and our homes and those areas of our homes that we most identify with what it is to be human. And we see this clearly in one of his other stories that I just want to mention briefly in which expectation supersedes reality. In Juan Darien, first published in 1920, a tiger cub who is noble, good and generous and even dressed in trousers and a shirt <laughs> and who later goes to school is taken in by a woman who hears the cub's whimpers of hunger and seeing his unopened eyes and how he sought her breast she felt in her aching heart that in the supreme law of the universe, one life equals another. And so she suckled the little tiger. He is described as a good student and having a good heart. And after a bit is referred to even as a child, a human child, but people dislike him. And as their hatred for him grows because of his coarse hair amongst other things, they treat him like a beast and his own memories of himself as a tiger in the wild start to flourish. He is incited to delve back into his past and asked whether he can see the rocks go by, the bending branches and the ground and trampled leaves. All these images come back to him with more and more strength until he becomes that hated animal that the humans he is surrounded by so want to see and fear. And so he turns into the violent beast that everyone except the woman who raised him was expecting him to be. She nurtured him, but the expectation of what his real nature was incited by the rest of the group won in the end. The violence and force was inside Juan Darien, along with his memories from the beginning, but it was human expectation that determined the perspective, good in the case of the mother who nurtured him and bad in the case of the others who did not accept him. Quiroga is considered the forefather of magical realism, and we can see why with this story. A tiger becomes Juan Darien, the child, and then again a tiger. And this transformation is a part of that community's lives. So the real and the paranormal, as in the things that are outside of the norm, acquire equal narrative presence here, which is typical of magical realism. It's a mode in which the extraordinary is quite a seamless part of everyday life in which what is other is not just normalized, but embraced. Whereas in the Gothic, we have a struggle to fight the mystery of the unknown, the other. And this fight often ends in failure. Maybe not. The mystery tends to remain unsolved. Maybe this is changing a bit. Perhaps in this, we have one of the contrasts between the two modes, but we're not gonna to go too deeply into these differences. I mentioned earlier that Quiroga's, one of his main literary influences was Edgar Allan Poe, with whom he shares this morbid fascination with death, with addiction and illness. But I will be looking at what is Gothic, specifically in the spaces of consumption in the feather pillow. So let's meet Jordan and Alicia. Over the last 10, 15 years or so, there's been an interpretation of this work as a vampire story. But when I studied and read this piece and discussed it more than 20 years ago, there was no mention of vampires in the literary analysis that I was exposed to at least. And in fact, in 2007, 
the feather pillow was turned into a stop motion picture or animation. And there is absolutely no shadow of anything vampire-like, my first pun. And Alicia hallucinates actually seeing a pig, which is a very interesting choice. There's another version in which Alicia goes out to buy her own pillow, and then another still in which we don't get to see the actual parasite, but we see the pillow moving on its own because of the parasite moving inside it. And I, I'll link these in the chat later. I suppose even now it's a story that very much is still open to interpretation. It's a story of a couple, Jordan and Alicia, who begin their life together as newlyweds. But Jordan's rigidity and coldness upset Alicia as a young bride and she's too shy to speak out. So she becomes unwell, suffers from hallucinations and eventually perishes in unexplained circumstances. Jordan tears open the pillow where Alicia's head has lain during her illness when a maid observes some drops of blood only for Jordan to make the discovery that inside the pillow was a beast swollen with Alicia's blood. It seems nice and soft to sleep on a feather pillow but what is going on in that fluffy interior? Similarly to the story about the tiger and many others about nature, Hiroga was in love with his beautiful jungle, but what dangers lie beneath this verdant, fertile environment? Fertile with horror, more like. I always thought that the story's first paragraph tells us all the most important things that we need to know and pulls us in with a real sense of discomfort. Imagine going on a honeymoon that gives you shivers or worse still, imagine walking along arm in arm with your husband and shuddering as you look up at him at his, quote, impressive stature. But it's not just his physical appearance. He also doesn't say a single word. Are we in the presence of a South American vampire? He's no Camilla. He doesn't seem to be very flirty or seductive in the slightest. And Dracula is quite chatty and he's not aristocratic like him. An emotionally unavailable twilight hunk, perhaps? Is he one of Edward Cullen's forefathers? But this kind of strong, silent man who does not express emotion is a particular configuration of masculinity that is culturally exalted. And we will go on into that in a little bit. When I mention this sense of discomfort, it's because even though there is this premise of coldness on Hordan's part, we are told that he, for his part, loved her, Alicia, profoundly, but never let it be seen. She, on the other hand, is blonde, angelic, and a timid young girl. And I think this is key to the rest of my interpretation of this story. It's not just him, it's also the house. The house that gives Alicia chills. It's bare and silent and cold. Jordan's footsteps echo from one room to another, and she grows thin has an attack of influenza and is only able to walk with Rodan's help after waiting for him alone for the whole day. But he does demonstrate a tenderness towards her. He isn't unkind. Rodan paces up and down in the drawing room, sometimes in the bedroom. And when he enters the room where she lies ill, she screams in fright, confused as to what she was seeing. Was it Rodan or was it an anthropoid poised on his fingertips, staring at her? It definitely wasn't a pig though. I don't know what happened in that version. So the echoes of Hordan's footsteps, his pacing, perhaps also transfer to how Hordan's corporeal form resounds as a hallucination for Alicia, taking on different forms. When she becomes too unwell to walk, Hordan's doctor is called to visit. Hordan and his doctor pass Alicia's wrist from one to the other, and then the diagnosis, anemia. When it's time to discuss Alicia's fate, Hordan's doctor and Hordan move to the dining room. Now the doctor represents science and authority in society. And he says Alicia must have complete rest, emphasizing her weakness once they move to the dining room. And we'll look into that symbology. Then after the doctor has explained that there is nothing they can do to help her, the text in my 1976 English translation translates Hordan's reaction as follows. That's my last hope, Hordan groaned, and he staggered blindly against the table, giving the reader a sense of Hordan's despair because he's groaning, he's staggering. But when you read the original, solo eso me faltaba, restopló Hordan, y tamborileó bruscamente sobre la mesa. That's the last thing I need, sighed or whispered Hordan. 
drumming his fingers abruptly or suddenly on the table. But his is not a groan of despair, and he does not stagger against anything in the original text. In fact, there is a certain gesture of impatience in the drumming, but also, eso me faltaba, this is the last thing I need. And Quiroga is once again offering us a little opportunity to take a peek at the awkward and uncomfortable side of this relationship, a little bit like the shivers during the honeymoon at the very start, and Alicia shudders when she looks up at Hordan. Alicia dies in the end, and the maid notices some strange bloodstains on the pillow when she drops it. Hordan feels the hair rising on the back of his neck, but he doesn't know why. Is he becoming aware of a different side to himself, his own self? Is he the one who allowed for Alicia to perish? first by disappointing her idea of what romance and love was going to look like and sucking the life out of her, their life together symbolized by her inability to move from the marital bed. And what role, what responsibility does Alicia have in this? Perhaps what kills her is her expectation of marriage. He loves her. And this is stated in the first paragraph that the love was there, but he is nothing like what she expected him to be. It is her own idea of love and romance, of what love and romance should be, that comes to haunt her in her bed. Once the honeymoon is over, her disappointment allows for the life to be sucked out of her. And again, we have this ugly contrast, the result of living alone with the illusion of love when she's left by herself during the day when Hordan is out, and her projection of who she thought he was in the context of her new life as a married woman. But there is no deception here. Hordan is how he is and he loves her in his own way. And when the maid announces that she has found something in the pillow, he freezes with terror. Will he need to confront the parasitic reality of the convention of marriage now that the scarcely perceptible hidden reality is there, pulsating in the shape of a monster full of his wife's blood? And I really like this picture. I found it, it was a good choice for one of the editions of this story. Again, we're in the dining room for this last part of the story when Hordan rips open the cushion on the table to reveal the animal that had fed on his wife, a brutal ball of bloated blood on the very place, the dining table, a symbol of bonding, civilization and humanity. And here is this parasite. And suddenly it's a space that also holds within its boundaries a killer creature. But how many unacceptable things are normalized? just because they are contained within socially acceptable boundaries of everyday life. But sometimes uncomfortable truths come out in spaces that they are, they are there to contain. And we have like this, a Gothic idea of consumption where everything is inside out and what was hidden deep in the feathers of an unhappy marriage is apparent for all to see in society, metaphorically speaking and literally on the dining room table. There was something about this story about how Hordan, though he loved Alicia, never let it be seen. And I think the symbology of consumption that of course encompasses issues of monstrosity and masculinity by focusing on the dining table as a symbol of society and of family, the tension between private desires and social expectations allows us to dig a bit more into this aspect. Is Quiroga trying to tell us something about social pressures is he questioning the false societal mask and issues of maybe authentic identity? In Women, Feminism and Social Change in Argentina, Chile and Uruguay, 1890 to 1940, Asunción Labrín states that through the dispersion of feminist discourses in the Southern Cone at the end of the 19th century, gender relations were put under rigorous scrutiny for the first time in the history of these nations. And though in practice, they did not change much, they were not to remain in unchallenged complacency. Lavrin discusses how feminists at this time promoted female education and intellectual equality, opposed the double standard of sexual morality, encouraged women's knowledge of their own bodies, encouraged free sexual expression, and opposed the idea that marriage was the only outlet for women. The Hispanic ideal for women was El Angel del Hogar, or the angel of the home, and she is a meek, homebound, pious, and selfless creature. She inhabits the private domestic sphere and lives entirely for husband and family. And at the start, Alicia is indeed described in these terms. Perhaps a statement is being made by Quiroga that she is part of a dying category. 
Quiroga's time was one in which promoters of women's rights attempted to foster female self-confidence by encouraging women to transgress gender norms of female silence and to speak about topics of intellect over the body that were traditionally banned for women. And Colin McKinney argues that the male ideal in the 19th century consisted of intellect over the body of prowess and strength. So men were expected to have these firm, muscular bodies that were self-contained and hermetically sealed and subject to self-discipline. Men were encouraged to control the public sphere and exert their authority over women, but men also underwent a predicament because they became victimized by medical discourses that scrutinized and pathologized male bodies and passions. The man who was unable to control his passions was not only considered sick, but he was also equated with the dreaded, fluid and sexualized nature of the feminine. The end um, of the 19th century was a time when the gender roles were particularly rigid and polarized and both sexes were expected to conform to unattainable ideals of manhood and womanhood. Alicia notices Hordan's silence and she wishes that he were able to express emotions more freely in that first paragraph. She is his wife now, so she goes along with it, shivering and shuddering at him in the background as he ignores her. But what has this silence done to her? The effect of this seems also to surprise Hordan himself, also a victim in a sense, as we've seen with these discourses on masculinity. So how appropriate for Hordan to rip open the pillow on the table to reveal the monstrous parasite transformed by Alicia's blood now contained within the confines of that same oppressive social space, a gruesome victim drained by convention. She has been literally consumed and there is her blood on the dinner table. And the table becomes a site of desecration of the idea of the traditional family and rules. Giroga writes about places that are as silent as death, like the jungle, like houses, and now the dining room echoes with death instead of life, instead of food and drink, Alicia has become the object of dinner, drained of her blood, now contained in this parasitic animal. And with this premise, I thought it might be nice to look at the dining table as a symbol within this Gothic idea of consumption. Uh, we're gonna stray a little bit away from Quiroga, so apologies if this is disappointing, but this is part of a larger study and I wanted to try it out if that's okay. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the dining table as a symbol. And as a symbol, it evokes images of people coming together and eating together to sometimes discuss intimate and personal things, but sometimes wider, say political issues, and in doing so, cultivate an atmosphere of community. So this space of consumption can also contain a hierarchical pattern. A family will have a status pattern that emerges at the table according to different places and how people relate to each other in this context. And all these patterns are still there. Even when the table is bare, it's still a carrier of that symbology, I argue. Margaret Visser explains in The Rituals of Dinner, written in 1991, that traditional families in Europe and America, which sat down to a dining room table with father at the head and mother who had prepared everything to his liking, seated at a lower place at the table to signify her subordination, soon taught the children who, officially at least, wielded the real power in the group. Visser describes the table as a constraining and controlling device. And most of the time, this is invisible to us as it's so ingrained with many other elements of our day to day. And here is when I started with this connection between expectation and awareness and that there is something damaging in how things are, what the expected norm is and a kind of horrifying realization through a confrontation with the monstrous when Hordan comes face to face with the parasite. In houses and apartments large enough to have one, the dining table traditionally stands in a separate room from the kitchen and it's a site of a household's daily meals. It represents as no other piece of furniture can really, and I was thinking about this, but no other piece of furniture is representative of the family as a unit. Um, I was thinking if the sofa, but even the sofa, because some, no, if any member of the family should be absent, then the empty place at the table is a mute reminder of a missing person. You know, have you ever watched a film in which the children have all grown up, they've left home, and then the parents are left behind and they face each other across this, great expanse of a table haunted by all the memories, all the fights and dramas that have unfolded around this symbol 
of the family itself. And maybe at some point in your lives, you may even catch yourself laying out a plate and some cutlery for someone who is no longer with you for whatever reason that may be. But many families now eat in the kitchen and um, maybe Ikea changed this. And the dining table has evolved into maybe not being just made out of wood, you know, no more just solid heavy oak, but it might be a lighter material like plastic. It might be a different color. It might be red or yellow, but it's still the same table that gave us the word commensality, meaning togetherness arising from the fact that we eat at one table. So eating around the table is a way for us to express the bonding mechanism, which is common to every human society, and that is sharing food. And only a certain number of people can fit around a table. So how does it make you feel maybe when there aren't enough chairs or you're a little bit squashed and you have to negotiate your legs around the leg of the table? It can be frustrating. You might feel less important compared to others who have a more comfortable seat. So who holds the power in these scenarios, for instance? If you're organizing a dinner and you're in a position of power with the choice of guests that you and only you can make, you hold that power. So if you think of this food space as a stage, you can control when and what people eat. The dinner table is one such stage. The menu is an interesting idea, this film, because one of the people who goes to this dinner was not invited and that messes everything up for the chef. Um, but I'm, you know, because there's a loss of control, but it's a relatively new film, so I'm not gonna give any spoilers. There's the obvious violence that can occur at the dinner table. And then there is the unsaid hidden violence that the rituals it stands for can hide, which I think is the case for Kiroga's story. Bad behavior is even worse when it occurs at the dinner table. Things are regimented and structured. And so we do take extra notice when something like this happens on a space like the dinner table. In Hispanic countries, the practice of conversation after dinner is called hacer la sobremesa and the guests linger, they talk sometimes for hours, and the table is felt actually to aid the conversation. So now we are getting closer to this infernal dialogue that Quiroga proposes with this story and this image. It is like a sacrilege or a trespassing of the dining etiquette of social rules. It's a subversion. Hierarchy at dinner can also be visible by the position of certain elements that we might take for granted, such as a salt. Um, in medieval times, for instance, the salt was placed in a certain position to mark the place of the host or a very important guest. And the positions of the rest of the guests were determined by how far away they were from the salt. And it made me think about how often there are these scenes in which a character asks for the salt. And it's an interesting moment um, in which there is a power play and how that can vary and how subtle it is. So the person who has more power passes something down to those who have less. This could be even a parent to a child, but it's still a monopolization of something, of the salt in this case, and they have the power to decide whether to pass it on or not. So they could pass it on straight away, or they could wait a bit while they have another mouthful. And we see this here. And yes, yeah, so to conclude this talk, the dinner table is an everyday object in the home, but it can lead to all kinds of situations and some are wonderful. Uh, and bonding, but we're not really interested in that here. Dinner scenes are a binding element, however, and they allow us to relate to our characters no matter how distant they are to us. Now, you may not have scissors for hands or be a cannibal, but we all have something in common with every character we see, and we generally sit down for dinner. So in fiction and films at the dinner table, anything is possible from poltergeist possessions to the arrival of an uninvited guest. And it can be the setting for the unexpected where cooked chickens can still move, for instance. You can learn a lot about characters by how they choose to have dinner. It can show someone's status and at what phase of a relationship they are in. So the couple here start off very close, but by the end, they are quite far apart. Dinner tables are great for big displays of violence and aggressive behavior. Plates and cutlery can be thrown and smashed, but sometimes it is enough to sit down and tensions will just start flaring especially when you're sitting with people that you may not know so well. But most of the time, vampires just want to get to know a little bit more about their next victims and how best to do this, if not at the dinner table. So perhaps Quiroga was not just the forefather of magical realism and the Edward Cullen vampire category, 
but maybe also the idea of the dinner table as a site of horror. And on that note, thank you so much for listening. <laughs>